Uh, good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, November 15th, and we are discussing, um, let's see, what are we discussing? Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur in Amsterdam. And um, this is a very funny anecdote. I was, I shouldn't say this because Ellen's on the board, but I was at the board meeting and I may have been researching <laughs> the book the story and i was sitting next to rabbi moffick he goes well you were busy on your computer <laughs> yeah. and and rabbi moffick goes oh that looks like a good book <laughs> what is it about and i'm like you're not going to get a sermon out of this it's a short story <laughs> you know it, just the way he said it um having worked low these many years with rabbis you're like oh what could that could i get a sermon <laughs> No. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about Maxim D. Schreyer. Um, even from his name, we get Maxim, you know that he's Russian. I'm just going to show, wait, I got to make sure I'm on the right thing. That, uh... one minute, one minute. Um, what would you like me to call you? Siri, go away. <laughs> if only I knew. So um he, you know, he I don't I don't know how old he is. Um, I'll tell you in a second. Born in 1967. Okay. So he's, you know, like 10 years younger than me. He's in his 50s. <laughs> <laughs> Took a hot minute. Um, there he is. Um, and um indeed, um he is from um you know, you can, the Russian, you know, comes out and this is from his website. Um, he was born in Moscow in 67 to Jewish Russian family with his parents, Amelia Schreyer and David Schreyer Petrov. He spent more than eight years as a refusenik and immigrated to the United States in 87. And just to review, um, to get to the States during that time, once you said you wanted to leave Russia, you lost your job, you lost everything, you had to have money, you had to be um, helped. So to be a refusenik was, um, you know, that, that you really took your your family took a huge hit um obviously he's very bright he studied at moscow university brown rutgers and received his phd at yale in 95 he's currently a professor of russian english and jewish studies at boston college where he co-founded the jewish studies program in 2005 and he's published 15 books and he's a recipient of a number of fellowships um, i mean look it's on his website um but now he lives in brookline um, which is, um, I call it the Skokie of Boston, and um, South Chatham. I have to ask Arthur with South Chatham. I don't know if that's on the Cape or, you know, that's his summer house. And he has, you know, two daughters. So um, as always, I, I do like to hear, ooh, I have to admit more people. Um, um, did you like the book? And we'll we'll go one by one. And if you're online, <clears throat> you can raise your hand or raise your hand virtually. Um, uh, Janice. I loved it. This is my most favorite stories that we've read so far. First of all, those of us who traveled, we spent Rosh Hashanah in this job. And to see the chandeliers with candles burning, it was really awesome. And going east in the promenade. So, at a shallow level, I love the sites because I've been to all of them. But to go further, you know, I, even if you're that an observant Jew, no matter what, you see through life through Jewish eyes. And for me, I've seen many wonderful marriages intermarry, at nothing against that. But for me, I couldn't imagine sharing my life, raising my children with someone who isn't Jewish. It's just the way things are, the way I see life. I love this, especially him coming from Russia, how much more that meant. And not religiously, it just your being. So I love this. Um, the age old story. Um, at first, I wasn't <laughs> sure what we, you know, every story, I'm like, are we gonna? I there's a little angst of are we gonna have enough to talk about? But we're gonna have plenty to talk about. Um, Susan. 
Uh, okay, yes, I too, I just, I really like this story a lot. And I saw so much of us in it. Um, and especially in my own family, my grandson just recently broke up with a Catholic girl that he was really in love with just because she was not Jewish. Yeah. He just said, I can't do it. I can't live my whole life with somebody who isn't Jewish yeah. and he's not particularly religious. No, really. It's just a culture thing. It's, yeah. it's a family thing. He just, he just couldn't do it. And one of the things that I, at the very end of the book, if you don't mind me just reading this. Sure. When, at the end of the story. At the end of the story where he says in four years, when Jake turned 40, he would have lived in America for half his life. Leaving Russia at 19, he had carried with him on the plane baggage so heavy that it took him years to unload it, and so lofty that there were still times he couldn't stand solidly on American ground. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the baggage, you know, was not a suitcase. The baggage yeah. is what he had in his head and in his heart. Yeah. Absolutely. All his horrible experiences that he had been through. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me even of my own father, who was only six years old when they brought him from Russia. But I remember when I was, you know, much younger and not even married yet. And my mother wanted to take a trip to Europe. And my father said, what do I want to go there for? I ran away from there. <laughs> yeah. and, and and so, it, I mean, they eventually did go, but but that was his attitude. And as I said, he came from a family of immigrants. Yeah. And uh, it, it's that baggage that they have with them their whole lives. Yeah. Um, Alan. Um, you wouldn't know the answer to this, but after what you read about the author, yeah. one wonders whether there's some autobiographical. Um, Interesting. I'll, I'm going to go back. Yeah. And okay. Um, I didn't love the story when I first read it, but when I reread it, I... I think I exactly that the thing that you read Sue Sue I had um, highlighted on my Kindle. I there were things about it. Here he is for the first time. And here, um, uh, okay, a little louder, yeah. Okay, here he is for the first time. Well, we don't know that for sure. Maybe he's gone away before, but he's away from the country and he's going back to to the United States. And I think he has an amazing. Well, he's gone through so much in terms of his own analysis of his life and what's important to him, but he's going back to a country that he has such hopes for. At the, at the very end, he says, remember, he's really optimistic about building his life and going back to the United States, that it kind of, I, it's the way it's told that made much more of an impression on me. It's not just that he decided not to marry a Jewish girl, but it's the whole process that he went through and, the, and wanting to atone you know, I didn't like the first time when I read it. I didn't think he was really atoning. He was, you know, he said he was atoning, but he wasn't. But when you go back and he's gone through all this mental analysis, he's gotten through his atonement. It depends on what atoning is. Judy said that the prostitute might have helped that. <laughs> um, Merle and then Andy and then Judy. Wait, wait. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. Okay, I was immediately struck by his name. He's Russian. And I, when I was in college, I majored in Russian. His last name, Glasman. Glas means I. And you have a feeling he's going to see something in Amsterdam, that there's going to be a revelation. And there was. I mean, when he goes into the temple and he feels so much better and everything, everything about the temple makes him feel better more protected. He, he, he loves his Jewish identity and he doesn't want to give it up or compromise. And I thought it was a great story, but I was just struck by the name Glasman because I thought he's going to see something. There's going to be a revelation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just the whole synagogue thing is interesting because, you know, the Russians, even though they had to give away their whole life to become a refusenik, there was no Hebrew school. There was no nothing. So they got here and <clears throat> they're here because they're Jewish. And then they, um, listen, as somebody who's, you know, been in the professional business a long time, you know, the Russians, nobody hears a Russian. Uh, they're, they're just a handful. That's all I'll say. And um, um, both the Russians 
and the Israelis um, have state sponsored religion, which means the state pays for it. So when they came here, they're like, what do you mean we have to pay? What do you mean we have but Israelis too? All right, Andy. Wait, it was a good story. It um, as far as that goes. I, but I think I read things with a, a, a this um, oh, this lens of hypocrisy. He talked so much about how things looked. He drew so many conclusions. He looked on the street. They were Philistines. They were this. Everybody was described and uh, just in this way of judging them. And I, that bothered me. And I felt like, okay, so he fasts because he's Jewish. That's the one thing he makes up his own uh, time. He um, buys things on Yom Kippur, goes shopping. I, I just, you know, and how he, it, it, and that's fine. I think everybody should do what they want, but I didn't. Um, but you're mentioning this to us because you don't really like it. Okay. Yeah. No, because I just, Sorry. that's how I felt. I, um. Uh, I don't know. I thought, I thought it was unusual that he went, decided to go to the the um, red light district. That was what he was drawn to. I don't know. It was just a Although, little. Although, if you talk to anyone who goes to Amsterdam, yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. a sight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know that. It, I'm surprised they didn't say more yeah. about getting high. Yeah. yeah. Putting it together. That's about the scent um, of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I, I okay. didn't think about how many, how everyone looks. Right. Ah, uh, Judy, very loud. Then Lynn, then Terry. I'll be very loud. I didn't like the story. Um, I admire this man because I can't write in a foreign language as beautifully as he wrote. But I didn't think his writing it wouldn't speak to me. Um, I, Louder. I have a problem with we. We all have memories of early temple experiences. I would think I have been in my, my, when my great grandfather was alive, I went to the shul. He didn't allow me to go be with the men. I could stand up in the front, but he said he would wave to me, which was a big deal. And I remember it perfectly. I could replay this day for you anytime. I think the things that this man noticed in that temple were not religion. And I, I just found it unappealing. I also had some questions. <laughs> on the second on the ADA, he said the small slice of life that had been served to him and about her on a green paper plate. I want to know the meaning of a green paper plate. I wrote you too. I am. Am. At the end. What's the deep yeah, yeah, thank you. Why should we be left with so many questions? And I just don't I don't believe his emotions were real. He could he didn't convince me. Sorry. Okay. Does um, anybody have an answer to the green point in the deep blue? No, no, I, no, no, I, I have no. questions. Okay, do you have an answer? Oh, I, have I, have a I also have questions. What you got? Okay. So Catholic Catholics, Irish Catholics, who's Irish? Okay. have a um, really deep culture, as do Jewish people, very deep, so that the green is like Christmas. It's it's what you do. Or St. Patrick's Day. Or St. Patrick's Day. It has to do with, with oh, the oh, kind of the color good. you yeah. would go to. Yeah, that's that good. Right. Like, uh -huh. And with the blue, of course, it's Jewish. Oh, green and the, the very thank bright. you, Mary. So I think you're right, yeah. I didn't explain it, but no, you know of course. you're right. And I think you have to know a lot about those cultures to get it. I mean, to ever think about blue and green and get, I, I just, I yeah, but you're, you, that, that, that makes sense. But he didn't, he didn't, he just threw it out there, but never, it, he, he expects you to know. Yeah, and then it's in the language. There are a couple things we expect to know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have Lynn, Terry, and then Elaine. Lynn. So the word that came Real loud. Me, I read this twice and underlined twice. And my the word that came out of my head was flat. Hmm. The story was flat for me. I didn't feel for him. Um, I know another see, this is our different perspective. Yeah. The first thing I think he's a very self-centered person. 
Uh, but you can read self-centered as a person searching. But I thought all he thought about was food during the entire <laughs> story. Now, can you read that a different way? Yes, he needs nourishment. He needs spiritual nourishment. Doesn't everyone think about food during Yom Kippur? No, I do. You know, it, was, it, was, this it wasn't, wasn't even it. during. This was before. <laughs> he eat enough food. Right. He, but I, I, I he would get being, enough to eat. I, but, and then but afterwards, he stuffed yeah. himself. I, yeah. I mean, to me, I am worried about him. I used to think I had to eat. But he's not a kid. No, but that's I, know. I know, I know. Well, to me, I put self-centered a lot, a lot on here. That he is um, worried about his emotion. I don't find him empathic for other people. Um, I just could not engage myself with this man, and I wish I could. And he's no kid to like. Should I get married? Should I not? Okay, I have um. Terry, Elaine, Evie, then Janice. Well, I just wanted to, one of the reviews I read said that um, in creating his character, Schreyer explored what it feels like to be wrestling with the mix of prosperity, professional pride, cultural loneliness, and insecurity that defines the lives of many ex-Soviet Jews. In Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, he offers a collective portrait of the whole collection of Jews in America who are struggling to come to terms with ghosts of their Soviet past. So I thought that kind of frames. That does frame it, absolutely. What, you know, He's struggling he between um, cultures. And, and the, the moment that I felt, um, I mean, I, I sort of mixed feelings. I, I also read it twice. I think I liked it. I don't know that I loved it, but I thought it was interesting. But the the moment when or the time when he and Aaron were in that meadow mm -hmm. he said he knew that Aaron needed his words and caresses but he couldn't find mm -hmm. anything within him to offer her yes. he had felt utterly alone at that moment then right there on that Vermont meadow he had already known that something was amiss except that it took him another year mm -hmm. to put that something into words so clearly he was struggling there was a part of him that knew this was not the relationship he should be in but he really liked being in that relationship. He liked traveling with her. She was fun, but she didn't really get what he needed at all. The idea of going to church with their children, which was horrifying to him. <laughs> I mean, that that was enough to just, you know, close the book. But I think that when she delivered, I have the, such a visual when she sent all of the gifts he yes. had given her. Oh, that was amazing. And they were wrapped. They were still wrapped. What was that? Yeah, I thought she rewrapped. I thought she rewrapped them. Oh, she rewrapped them. All right. See, she was being very green, Andy. She rewrapped. Rewrapped. Yes, but then I, I, I yes, quickly, because I have Elaine. I do want to touch on um mixed messages because my daughter's in a mixed message and they're working it out beautifully and they're doing fine and the statistics on mixed marriage is now sky high so the question is when she comes back and says to him i mean she's got a past too so she comes out and said oh i'm sorry i will raise your children but i can't convert and i know sure. people like this Particularly if their parents are still living. Lots of times they convert afterwards or not. But to me, the heart of the story, I mean, this is important to the story, but the heart of the story is not mixed marriage. No. It's the, the, I think the heart of the story is his trying to um, assimilate maybe mm -hmm. uh, within the American culture, but having a very difficult time and can't let go of that past. If you, if you can't let, I, I mean, I taught a book, My Antonia, where the father is so hooked on the past, he can, he, he doesn't survive. Yeah, that's a beautiful book. So okay. Yeah. Um, Elaine, then um, Abby, Janice, and Beverly. Elaine. Okay, I like the story. I didn't love it, but I think it certainly depicts reformed Jews of, say, the 70s and 80s. 
I think, Andy, I remember my mother and I never, ever fasted for Yom Kippur. We just never did. We would go out to lunch at the Delicatessen on Madison Avenue after services. And I still Probably remember after. moving to Highland Park and going to Neiman Marcus on Yom Kippur in between the two services because it wasn't very busy. But <laughs> I have a question. So I think, I mean, I'm I'm giving more information, which I should tend to do than, than you all need to know, okay? Uh, and the other question I have, did he go back to the girl at the end of the story or no, he did not? Okay, well, that I wasn't 100% sure. Definitely not. But, but I think people do struggle with their uh, Jewishness and their American, and I think certainly immigrants of that era, but how strong was his Jewishness in Russia? We don't know that. Because it wasn't. It wasn't, no. So I, I think this was like, did he really did he really want to get married? I mean, he was older. But I, and was this just an excuse not to marry? Yeah, you, that's exactly what I think. You have no idea that that, that was right. a strong motivation or just that I'm not going to be married. It's too much trouble. Right. All right, Janice. I think you have to separate a religious Jewish person, a culturally Jewish person. Yes. It can be very, very different. And he is not religious, doesn't pretend to be, but it's something within him, whether it came from his parents, even though he was in Russia, probably from them, the struggle they had because they were Jewish. It's a cultural thing, and he just couldn't go beyond that. So... He, yeah, everyone was Jewish a different way. We kept a kosher home, but my parents gave out. I have an aunt and uncle who are really orthodox. One would eat a salad in a restaurant. One wouldn't eat anything. We all do it right differently. No right. one does it perfectly. Right. Everyone makes their right. own choice. Yeah. Beverly. Wait, 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 wait. I'm unmuting you. Okay, go. Thank you. Hello. So my mother came from Russia and what she wanted was to be an American. Yes, they all did. That, and what did that mean to her? She used to say in her early years, it meant she wanted an umbrella. She wanted a slip under her clothes. She wanted white gloves. These were things that she never had. As a, She came as a girl. And so her goal was to be an American. And everybody articulates that in a different way. And his description of this Aaron was all the things that an American girl would look like, not a Jewish girl. And I think that, that maybe he was also searching how to be an American in this country after having lived in Russia. Yeah. But what he had was a, a Jewish neshama. He had a soul. And yeah. that was not explainable. It had nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with education. It's just something Jews have. That's yeah. an amazing, amazing, un unexplainable or inexplainable. I'm not sure phenomenon um the other thing um you we can't underestimate cultural differences and this is one of my favorite anecdotes that happened to a good friend of mine um a cantor he's in california now but he in you know grade school he was in milwaukee they went away to camp and this one kid boris from russia was a nice guy but he smelled <laughs> smelled terrible and no one wanted to be with him, partner with him, anything. And finally, my friend had like the talk with him and um, said, Boris, you have to shower. <laughs> you have to wash your clothes. And after that, he did. And I think it it turned his life around and he still sees him. And um, he tells the story much better than I do. But, um, you know, sometimes 
And I had an Israeli friend. As Americans, um, we don't usually say, um, oh, you're sitting in the wrong place or you're doing this. And I took an Israeli um, TA to swim at the pool in Michigan and she was doing it wrong and I didn't say anything. And she goes, Vanessa, why didn't you tell me I need to swim this way and that way? You know, Israelis are very in your face. You know, they ask you, how much money do you make? And blah, blah, blah. You know, and as Americans, we don't do that. That's very gauche. So um, I can only imagine uh, what both the narrator and and the author have have gone through in life. Um, His wife is Dr. Somebody... Um, Lazar, Lasser, I'm going to say that sounds Jewish, but I'm sure he knows a lot of intermarried um, who amongst us doesn't. So I think that, um, but I agree, this isn't about um, intermarriage. Merle. Hey, well, when she says to him, Jake, I'll give you children and I'll help you raise them Jewish, um, but, but I can't give up my faith. And then finally she says, Why can't you accept me? And he doesn't answer her. But I think the story explains it. I used to teach English as a second language to Russian Jews for many years. And what I found is they don't observe the holidays, really. They'll pick one that they love, like one lady loved Passover, and she would always talk about that. They don't do Shabbat. He said the only holiday he celebrated religiously was Yom Kippur. And when he does go to the prostitute, I think he was happy that she was half Jewish. And he (laughs) said, I just want to talk to you. I just want to talk. She was half Jewish. But uh, and also there was another thing about when he was going to plan a trip with his girlfriend, Aaron, they were going to the Riviera. And he said he wanted it to be an eye opener for her. Again, this reference to I from like Glasman was his name. But Russians are so particular in their customs. And I had this terrible argument with a lady in the class because it was somebody's, it was a birthday. It was, oh, it was my birthday. And I wanted to treat them to a Russian movie at the Highland Park Theater, which at that time was very, very cheap in the afternoon. And so I think it was $2 the person. So the next day, this one lady comes in and she sort of throws $2 on the table at me. I said, no, no, our custom is we pay for the party. She says, well, it's not our custom. And then she starts <laughs> yelling at all the other Russians to give me $2. I said, absolutely <laughs> no. And I wanted to start the class. Finally, I took her $2 and I just, yeah. you know, ended it. I'm well, saying, I, we would never do that in America. We wouldn't make a scene, we, none of that. And that is just characteristic that that was a classic example yeah so the russians are very particular so but anyway this thing about why can't you accept me he couldn't even explain it to her but the story explains it yeah um alice then lynn yeah i just wanted to give um a little comment on um the author's biography when i read it and he he teaches at boston college it rang a bell in my head because I don't know, this is not a new book. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's by um, a Ukrainian man, um, Lev Golinkin, who came to the United States around the same time. I think it was like 89, 90. And it's, he wrote a book about it. It's called A Backpack of Bear, Eight Crates, oh, yes. and Eight Crates yes. of Vodka. But he ended up going to school at Boston College. Mm. You know, Boston College is a Catholic school. Yes. I mean, mm. you know, it's like, you know, Loyola. I mean, it doesn't mean they're just Catholics, yeah. but I mean, that. but I just thought it was interesting that both the author of our story right. and the author of this book, who were both, you know, from, you know, the, US, the former USSR, ended up at Boston College. I actually was got the book out to see if there was any acknowledgement of this, you know, this our author, but there wasn't. But I mean, but also what I remember about this book, which is similar to the story is, it's just, I think what other people have said, he's searching, he's just not sure. How does he fit into American society as a, as a Russian and as a Jew? And He's not even so confident of his Jewishness. So it's like, 
a lot of, he has a lot of questions, which I think the end of the story, I thought there was going to be like an answer, but there's not. I think he's still searching. He's still searching. Um, Abby, I didn't get to you. So it's Abby, Lynn, Judy. Okay. Um, you know, I Real learned, loud. I learned so much more from the discussion. I love the story, but there's so many layers that have come up now. And so I'm going to talk about my friend. I think, well, it's Marina. I don't know. Marina, I met the very first day of college. We were complete opposites. I was completely so shy and quiet, and she was a complete extrovert. Marina was raised in Russia, was part of the Chinese ghetto, lived in Ecuador, and I met her after two weeks in the United States. We became fast friends immediately. Marina, who was raised in the Russian Jewish culture and the Chinese, uh, Chinese Jewish culture, married Roger. People took bets on this marriage not working out. There isn't a day since October 7th that I have gotten a very, very strong email from Marina about the Israel war. Marina, uh, in her retirement, teaches at Brandeis, Dean of Russian Literature, as well as Russian to Americans. She introduced me to Chinese food, which I was, didn't know about until I, was, until I met her. She is so multicultural. People thought that, and Roger, first of all, at that time, you know, he was several years younger, which at that time was a little, and he went out of state to get married. Um, and um, their son, who is now in his latter 50s, was the first, uh, uh, they lived in New Orleans, and he was the first uh, Jew and the first Yankee who was head of the Bar Association. Oh. They are so immersed in in the synagogue in New Orleans, as well as the synagogue in Boston, she, she taught all over the world in terms of um, with other universities, adult education, education, so forth, so forth. And um, the ties to her Judaism are so strong, as well as those of her children. And I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful to see. And what I read about in this story was just the Jewishness in his 50s. And I think we all, you know, so many of us do struggle in terms of even several generations down, where do we fit in this Jewish cultural whatever? I mean, I've had this conversation with my kids in terms of the fact that I've never had um, uh, ribs, and they can't understand that. And it's not true. They just think it's not part of my culture. And um, I'm willing to do it, but just haven't been able to verbalize it. Uh, and I think that's something that we all sort of struggle with. But I did love the story, but I'm so glad that Elaine asked the question because I wasn't sure if he went back to oh, her or not. Okay. <laughs> um, I have Lynn, Judy, then Merle. And Izzy. Um, the top of the mediator who describes her, we, we don't get that much of her, but she, it does not seem that she is a great intellect. And he said that uh, she has a languid indifference to the larger picture of the world. Yeah. And so then he says he wants to, knowing this, he is uh, going to appeal to, I mean, that I think bothers him, but then he's going to take her on this eye-opening trip rather than a mind-expanding trip. So Interesting. to me, there's a little disconnect there. Yeah. But um, my feeling about him is in his attempts to assimilate and be American, he's still holding, I said this before, his high school Moscow gang, he's still hanging out with those guys and it's got a huge impact on him. He's hanging on to that culture. And when you're hanging on to a previous culture and then trying to assimilate into a new culture, you're gonna be a mess. And so I think Aaron, I want to speak up for Aaron. I think in this case, he is sacrificing the good for the perfect. Interesting. Um, oh, yeah. Look at her. He takes, she keeps, sends back all the stuff and what's in there. All the letters that he's written her, all the postcards, even the emails, the faxes. And she said, Jake, I loved you more than anything, but not more than oh, Jesus. Jesus. That, that was right. That was all I was right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Yeah. 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 Always want them to say, and Jesus was Jewish. And Jesus yes. was Jewish. Yeah. Okay. Said, she also said, don't make me give up Jesus. Yeah, yeah that okay. was that line to yeah. me was yeah. it. Do you not think that couples who are going through this are juggling back and forth, especially if both have a strong faith? Yeah. That's a huge conflict. Yeah. I don't think he wanted that conflict. He's got enough struggles on his own, but I think That's he's true. giving up something really worthwhile here and he keeps saying he's lonely and he keeps saying what a great relationship they had and all the trips they took and how they were on the same page i she's shaking her head i have a daughter who's married I agree. To a, I, 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 an italian catholic who is not strong in his faith and is willing to compromise no end and they joined an outreach program and she is probably more involved than he but he doesn't object she's yep. taking her daughter to the jewish holiday classes they do shabbat in the park i mean she said she would do that too she said yeah. she would do that she said she would raise these kids too I know. I okay judy merle then izzy um preface what i'm going to say but my daughter was married to a, a non-jewish person who died um he was generous in his religion by saying, if this makes you happy yeah. and makes our children happy, it <laughs> makes me happy. So I was happy. <laughs> Didn't bother me at all. And I should tell you, he's black. He was black. So a lot of my, I, I, I learned from my friends were. Um, mm. He was a great guy. He was a, he made my yeah. daughter happy. Okay. Works for me. All right. Now I will tell you. The, the prostitute was interesting to me, <laughs> uh, truly. Um, I don't think anyone's ever asked a prostitute what religion her parents were. Oh, uh, I bet they, they ask a lot of questions. Uh, I don't know. We should call them sex workers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, just sex, I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> What happened when they didn't have sex? I think that happens all the time. Oh, I'll bet, really? I, I do agree with yeah. that, but well, the question about religion, religion, religion does seem straight. But here she says, just remember, difference is oh, only good, good right when you can comprehend it. Well, so he, I, and I think okay. that's the crux of his problem. He doesn't know where he's different. Yeah. He knows where he's different, and he can't figure out how to make mm -hmm. it not different. Yeah. So I love that. I love that. I love that. Okay, Merle, then Izzy. <clears throat> My daughter is a bar and bat mitzvah tutor, extremely observant, spends her life at the synagogue. She's married to a guy who's Methodist who wears a giant cross. And the last time I came to visit them, he left two VHS cassettes on my pillow saying the life of Jesus. Do you want to watch this? <laughs> and then he said, it's just a joke, Merle. I'm taking it away. I'm kidding. Because you I said mean, I don't have a VHS recorder. <laughs> yeah, but I, I actually do. I actually do. But anyway, um, he's just such a sweet guy. He never has the kids going to church or any. He doesn't go to church. But what happens here in this book is she she says to him again in a, a different scene, she says, why can't you accept me for what I am? And this time he does sort of answer. He says, I do love you, Aaron, but I just can't marry you. We are a small people. The mother of my children has to be Jewish, no matter how you slice it. And this thing about we are a small people. Israel is what? The size of New Jersey. He doesn't want to end our people. I think he's got this, he's already gone through the whole Russian experience. He wants to be free to be Jewish. He doesn't want to assimilate with another religion now. And I thought that was one of the best, most telling lines in the story that he, he accepts us for a being a small people and wants us to continue to exist. So I, I, I love that response. I thought the first time he was very cowardly not to answer her, but this was a good response. Okay, um, Izzy. Um, I, I, you know, I agree. I just, I didn't find he was fleshed out or there was that enough to know about him. We didn't hear about his past. We didn't hear about, I just felt like I didn't know him. And he just flittered around and I wasn't even sure he was going to find the synagogue that night. I mean, at two o'clock in the afternoon, he decides to visit a prostitute. 
just it just all was kind of jagged. It just kind of didn't kind of feel it. And I didn't feel like I needed him. And then listen, trust me, people call at two and o'clock in the afternoon and say, Can I come to services? <laughs> that is very realistic. <laughs> Sitting at, you know, <laughs> in the it's office. Again, but I didn't even know he was going to be going to see anybody. Yeah. He didn't even say that. Yeah. And that's the only he didn't know any Hebrew. You know, you don't know anything about his upbringing. He was successful. He came here at 17. Right. Now 36. Again, I think he he, 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 he was a reform too. Right. But if when Russians come here, they know no Hebrew. They are very, very ambitious. They, you know, um, and successful. So I think he assumes you know that. But then it says, yeah. The Jays like this, like it in Amsterdam, like one club here, the young mothers pushing their children. accepted here, wanted by the elderly gentleman, probably a banker whom we asked for directions. He felt wanted by the two shop assistants that are shoes. Well, because he bought a pair of shoes. So yeah. The way he went by. But he liked the, the unprescribed way of atoning for his people of Amsterdam. His head more and more transparent with hunger. His body. Goes, I don't get that. I don't get why he had, he felt what? What what happened in Amsterdam that he felt so wanted? For those particular people. Yeah. These random people. These random people. It just didn't. It just makes sense to me that he just right. It's a, a frame of mind, and I'm they're they're nice to tourists. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people say that when they go visit a place. Oh, I could live here. I just thought I don't know. He was a slow learner. Slow learner. Okay. Um, I have Andy. One year, one year. <laughs> he called him that, and he figures out he's thirty. He kept some yeah, I know. Don't you think that he would realize that then? Is no. That as as they get older, it, I'm sorry for her. Yeah. Um, I have Andy Lane, and then Evie. Andy. Oh. Hi, Andy. Oh. Okay. You're good. You're unmuted. I'm good. Okay. Um, I think that the you know Aaron it got right down to the line. She really loved Jesus. That's the core of their religion. What does he love? He loves people that look like him. He loves to fast on. I mean, I think when you got right down to it, he didn't have any, um, it didn't seem like he had any knowledge of Jewish teaching or anything that was the core of the religion. It was all about um, what you do and what, you, I mean, and that's, Okay, but I just think um, he hadn't really examined a lot of things, and um, it wasn't his fault, yeah. you know. And well, at the beginning of the refuse refuse next, um, I did not go to Russia. I think I it was in my childbearing years, but a lot of colleagues went, and they would bring a sidur, and we would spend our money to produce Russian Hebrew texts and workbooks. I mean, it was a it was an industry and it was a huge thing and you could get in trouble and, you know, uh, it, 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 it was a business. So, uh, you know, I there's just no way those Russians knew anything. And then they could either come here, or go to Israel. Um, and, uh, you know, when you said Marina, Abby, we had a teacher, Marina, and she it's a very Russian name, but she went to Israel and in Israel, you, you know, you speak Hebrew, you learn Bible in school. And then she came here and she goes, well, I can teach. I said, have you ever taught before? She goes, no. I said, listen, I can teach you to teach because you're in, and you're going to do X, Y, and Z. She was a great teacher, but you know, she knew everything, not always from experiencing it and, or experiencing it as a secular Israeli. Um, so it's just a fascinating thing. Okay, I have that was Evie, and then um, no Elaine, Elaine, okay. Evie. All right, we forget to think about that he kept this woman in his life for two years, and all of a sudden he has this revelation that he has to be married a Jewish woman. I mean, if, I'm assuming that the woman was close to his age. And, and we haven't talked about how. I thought she was younger. Well, not that uh, noticeably younger, you think. But anyway, maybe she wanted to get married and he had kept her involved in the two. And all of a sudden he has this revelation of 
that he can't marry her because his children can't be raped. I mean, we really haven't discussed this poor woman who dedicated two years of her life to him. Yeah, I when that happens to couples, and it does, it does. I say that's like a divorce. You know, they've lived together, their households are together, um, you know, they're older, they're not, you know, kids. That's like a divorce. Yes. And, um, I also think this is Vanessa, you know, as, as people get older, you get used to living by yourself and it just makes it harder to. Um, OK, um, Evie, Lynn and Susan. You don't often hear that in here. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm the only child of an only survivor. And my father, actually, who was like close to 50 when it came to the United States, was a very late in life person, uh, child. Um, but he had two nephews that did survive, and they went, they moved back to Vienna. And in 1967, um, I went to visit them. I was their guest and I'm all, you know, la la because Israel this and Israel that. And I was startled to see all these anti Semitic things. Okay. And my first night there, as I'm getting to know them, they're telling me about their daughter, who at that time she must have been maybe about 10 or 11 years old. I was, I had just graduated, so I was like 20, 21, something like that. And they had sent her to Catholic school. And she came home, and this must have been right around that time, and she said, Mommy, are you Jewish? And she said, yes. Daddy, are you Jewish? Why did you kill my Jesus? Oh, oh, this is my introduction to wow. this family that I did not know. And then the following day, they took me to the cemetery to show me my grandmother's grave. And I think that that cemetery was on the news last week saying this was the only member of your father's family that died a natural death. So I was really, and I was just breaking up sort of with a boyfriend that I had for many years. So it was just an, an, an unpleasant, it was a very, very difficult uh, trip for me. Um, but, uh, and I understood it. And then a few years later, or no, a number of years later, when our son, who was probably about, to, it was right after his bar mitzvah, and he wanted to meet the children of these, uh, meet this other cousin who was visiting his son in um, Montreal, who totally gave up his Judaism, except for the relatives on the other side that were in Israel that I don't know, have any connection with. And um, he was going to travel to other family and it was Rosh Hashanah. And he said, I don't travel on a day when my, when my fellow Jews are in synagogue. And I was tired to that because he had totally given up his religion too. But getting back to um, the Amsterdam thing, I have found that when I'm when I've been someplace where nobody knows me, I'm a little bit more comfortable. I feel that there's not that judgment of me. Interesting. And, and I can be myself or whatever, whatever me I want to portray that day. But there's a certain comfort level of being anonymous. I right. Think. I don't know you. You don't know me. And you I can go on. Or some stupid question about a cosmetic thing that I wouldn't even want to do with. Or exactly. Care. You're, um, I have Lynn, Susan, and then Mary. Lynn. So I landed on the last page, um, yeah. and I had circled the word rooted, R-O-O-T-E-D, rooted. I'm, and I'm thinking this, this gentleman has come here at the age of 19, correct? I'm 19. 17? 17, 19. 19. 19. Really, an important age in an adolescent's older adolescent's life, where he has only known one thing. Oh, we can rush at nineteen. Nineteen. He has no roots. He is flowing in the wind. He's just searching, searching, searching. And to me, visiting the prostitute was a choice. I mean, a desperate choice to get answers. He wants answers from the prostitute. Yeah, exactly. Didn't anyone find that weird? Strange? Ridiculous. Ridiculous. But Ridiculous. to a person who is searching, and think about it, you're first 19 years old, and he has been ripped, his roots have been ripped out from his native country. And now he's in a new trying to be in a new country. And he has to start all over again. He has to plant new roots. Because he said, 
He arrived with a plan in the streets of Amsterdam. He would return to Baltimore, where after 17 years, his immigrant family had rooted themselves. They had even brought back from Moscow and reburied the remains of his father's parents. So they, in turn, are planting new roots by taking this his parents and planting them there. So I guess I could forgive him a little bit for <laughs> trying to find himself. And yeah, and he made choices. And we're watching him make choices. Yeah. I guess I was very judgmental of the choices he made. But those are his choices. I don't see I guess Okay. We uh, we have Susan and then Joyce. Oh wait. Oh yeah. Okay. So um I've been listening to what everybody has to say. And uh, one of the things, I mean, definitely this is a man searching uh, for who he is in his core. And uh, one of the things that I that really struck me was when he visited the synagogue in Amsterdam. And he starts describing the way the cantor looks and the way the rabbi, the way everybody looks. And then he describes the physical being of the place and, and who's dressed like this and who's like that. And he's looking and he's thinking and, but somehow, and then it says he still feels alone. And uh, this is a lonely man. Yes. And then he gets into his relationship with Aaron and he knows something is amiss. Something is missing. And he it takes him time to figure out what it is that's missing. And, and then he comes to the conclusion that if he marries, the mother of his children has to be Jewish. And I think it all stems from this visit to the Amsterdam synagogue, where even though he's not religious, he knows nothing about the uh, the rituals. Uh, he's never, and in America, he went to a reformed temple. Uh, uh, he never fasted. You know, this was all different to him. But he he wants something to hang on to. And he finds that Judaism is what he wants to hang on to. And I forgive him all his other characteristics because he's really searching. And I've been to Russia and they are the most dour people you could ever want to meet. <laughs> there were, I mean, trying to look for a smile on somebody's face was not easy. Um, and even when we went to the synagogue in St. Petersburg that they were trying to rebuild, I mean, the people were just dour. Yeah. I agree with you. All right. I have Joyce, Mary, and then Judy. As an antithesis to that, Susan, I want to say that um, I agreed with his um, feeling about Amsterdam in saying he could live there. It is one of the uh, friendliest cities that I had ever been to. I mean, people were there to help you and talk to you. And I thought it was just a great city. Secondly, um, when he went to the red light district, I don't think he was going to um, have sex with a, uh, a sex worker. I think he was actually looking for someone to talk to, mm -hmm. even if he had to pay her. <laughs> I mean, he he was there, but he really didn't have, he didn't connect with anybody. He was lonely and he was looking to have a connection with somebody. Thirdly, um, Somebody said it very early in our conversation, even though he wasn't religious, he did want to fast on Yom Kippur, and he did, it was important for him to find a synagogue, and he, um, oh shoot, I just forgot the third thing, um, 
I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. I right. forgot that. You put it in the chat and I'll read it to everybody. Um, I'll, I have to write down who's talking next. Mary. <laughs> I have a couple of things to say. Sure. Number one, I have a new oh. so, And, and I, you converted when? When my parents did. Okay, then, yeah. But they already knew. I mean, from, I mean yeah. when we raised our children Jewish, um, and I think that, from my perspective, is that when you're in a mechanic, you are going to have to make a choice if if you want your children to be religious. Okay. Have a religion, I would say. Have, yeah, have you a know, religion. Because people can be religious without being observed. Exactly. Exactly. But to have a religion, you there has to be a, a decision made. Mm -hmm. And it's it's tough, and people go on a journey with it. It's not something that just happens. Like you wake up and go, oh, I think I'll marry a Jew. Yeah. I'm a Christian. Yeah. And, it doesn't work that way. Right. And I'll have Jewish kids. Right. Exactly. So I got I got, and I think he was very tied in to children because when he went to the synagogue, he noticed the, the children. Yes. And when he was, it was all. It, it, and, and I think you get Didn't to a certain age, and you go, it's about family. And I think that's very typical of. Like the generation today, they don't get married till they want a family. Right. Interesting. Okay? They hang out together, but they don't. Yeah. It's a different thing, and I so I think that was that's an impulse that's very this line there that we, you know, um, I think that. Okay, so another thing is that my son's very best friend in high school, in junior high, was a Jewish immigrant. In fact, he did his bar. He and his sister did their bar and bat mitzvah together. He did it when he was maybe 15 and she was they, Were they Russian? They were Russian. Russians, but, yeah. And his family grew up in Russia. Um, as, you know, he, he was a Russian Jew. He went by Michael when he was until college and he changed his name to um, Misha. Mm. He changed his last name, which I never remember his father's name because he the tradition is you go by your mother's name oh. and you have and so he wanted to Americanize a little bit, but not totally. It went by his mom, but he changed his name. He became he 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 was he got his religious education here in Reform Temple, but when he got to college, he became very conservative. Yeah. And and he married a conservative Jewish Russian immigrant daughter. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um and he, I mean, he would fast on every holiday. I, I still remember he was going to to Europe or to study, and he was like, he's standing at my door to say goodbye, and he goes, "And I'm not eat, I'm fasting." I said, "Don't get on an airplane." I'm not fasting. <laughs> You're trying to eat something, yeah, something. Michael. This is not good. Um, but you know, there was there. He went through a process, and it's a mixed process. The other thing is that Russian Jews had nothing. And these friends who are Russian, their parents have dashas in their lips. I mean, yeah. their grandparents. That doesn't make sense to me. And just leave Russia for a holiday. That doesn't make sense to me because I know it's not that easy. That is, his friends who are Russian just showed up. I mean, they can, but it's not, you know, I don't know. That was a little bit yeah. like. I mean, they, most Russians who leave have to leave everything there. Exactly. So they're just. They're dachas. They're leaving their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Have, yeah. have dachas, which are. Some yeah. homes, winter homes, but it's right. not the regular, you know, right. it's just not, you know. Right. So that was sort of weird to me. Um, and um, I think that the other thing is, is that when you deal with Christianity, the Irish Catholics are the most, most mm -hmm. culturally, it's much more than just a religion. To many of them. Not all. I mean, that's a general. What about religion. Italians, though? But Italians do Catholicism yeah. is very different. You can yeah. be a Methodist. I was a Presbyterian slash Episcopalian. <laughs> but so, so the point is, I th it, 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 it's a different mindset totally. And um, and this is not an unusual thing. My so, so my son-in-law's parents, he is Jewish, so his, his father. His mother was Irish Catholic. Uh -huh. She converted to raise the children Jewish, which she did. All three, two, well, two one is not observant, but yeah. two of them are you know, observing and care about it uh, with some children. But then it's when they when the last one left for college, she went back. She became a Unitarian. Oh interesting. Really interesting. In Unitarian. Y'all know because she was never quite comfortable. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. something she did she did her duty. Yeah. She did what she had to do. Her children were like furious. I can only imagine. But anyway, so I think that it's always a process and always difficult, and you never know what you're going to bump into. 
But I think he was making a decision about marriage and family and children. I think in his life, beyond just his dating life and his sex life and his whatever <laughs> life, you know, I think that he, he was going through the process in his mid-30s to say, you know what, what's really important to me? Yeah. And I, that I understand. <clears throat> well, it is um 1104. And um, I know a lot of people had doctor's appointments and had to drop off. And thank you. They put stuff in the chat. It's good to see everyone. We meet again on December 6th. We're doing, um, just hit it up, Zion the Profane. Zion the Profane. So um, it looks good. Uh, um, this Sunday, there's no adult enrichment because we have a field trip to the Goodwill Free, yeah, the Baptist Church. Goodwill Free Hope. No, Good Hope Free Will. That's what it is. <laughs> and um, there is a bus. Let me know if you want to go on the bus. And um, if you are coming, if you can bring some dessert, because they are going to give us lunch. And I think that's it. Um, watch your Macomb at home. we got some lovely things coming up. Latka, latka vodka. And um, just good to see everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great class.